royal palace of Azuna St. Paul II. Please pay attention to the necklace that uh, the Griffin Demon is wearing. These are round beads and they actually represent the same chain of circles that we showed before. So therefore, what this Griffin Demon is wearing is the ecliptic around, uh, around his uh, neck. This is also the, um, the uh, uh, item that gives him his divine origin. The same information is found in the chaplet. Now here, um, here the goddesses Mulisu and uh, Inanna, sorry, um, Mulisu, Ashur's consort, and Inanna, standing on the lion, are also holding uh, chaplets. Now if you pay attention to the chaplets, they are also represented with the help of round, round beads, again representing the ecliptic. That's why they are called, this is why these chaplets and necklaces we are used as amulets and as protective symbols because there was encoded information. However, this astronomical encoded information was not known to everyone. It was known only to a few consecrated people and therefore they were valued for those people. However, for the Monday, um, this information was not, um, uh, uh, was not accessible. Now, uh, the creators of these symbols naturally knew the structure of the ecliptic and solar astronomy, as I said. Therefore, they could actually uh, put this information into any round, uh, into any round object. Not only that, but by manipulating different shapes of the beads or different shapes of objects, they could render even more complex information. In this particular illustration, as soon as Paul II is pointing, is pointing at the symbols of his, uh, of his god, but please pay attention to the necklace that he is wearing. The necklace consists of flat and round beads. Now I will go to the next, um, to the next illustration. So the same combination of flat and round beads is repeated in the chaplet uh, held by Inanna. Now in this case, we, in order to understand what astronomical information is given in these, uh, in these jewelry pieces, we have to uh, um, uh, resort to a very uh, small kind of experiment. Imagine that we are holding the necklace horizontally. In this case, the flat bead which is, on the, uh, which is on the left and the round bead next to it will represent the autumnal equinox for me and the uh, spring equinox for you. However, if I view the flat bead uh, on the right and the round bead next to it, in that case I will have the vernal equinox and for you it will be the autumnal it will be the uh, autumnal equinox for you. Yeah, differently put, uh, the, the, basically what we see in the arrangement of beads here is the same what we saw with the graphical representation of the solar, um, of the solar system a few minutes ago. Now, um, I will proceed to the next illustration and I will go very quickly through the illustration because I want to come to Donny with the net. Now, here in this illustration from the facade of Inanna's temple at Uruk, with, uh, at the top and at, at the bottom, we see the same chain of circles between two edges, between two edges uh, <coughs> of the ecliptic. Now, uh, the um, the knowledge of the ecliptic, of course, go gave the creators of the symbol to uh, designate different uh, uh, different phases of the sun in uh, different <coughs> images. Here, we, uh, the rod and ring actually represent, which is uh, given here in uh, this uh, flag from um, in this flag of the 9th century Assyrian flag. We see God Shamash holding the rod and ring. Now, the next one, the rod and ring. Now here, uh, this is the uh, archaic cylinder again, and God is holding the same uh, rod and ring. Now in this uh, representation though, Ashur is holding the same rod and ring or Doni in its autumnal equinox, and we can see that. Now the, the next item which is extremely important is the, the, is the uh, ring poles. The ring poles are said to be the earlier representations of the rod and ring, and here in this composition, uh, having the uh, God Azu, we see uh, we see the ring pole, uh, we see the ring pole where the ring is attached higher onto the shaft, the, the, which
which means that it is not the vernal equinox, but it denotes and it, it uh, contains different information. I will talk about this information a little bit later. First, let me show you some other uh, some other illustrations. This is also an archaic cylinder, and we see again two um, two ring poles, and one of them is uh, uh, showing the uh, this is the spring equinox, and the other one is the autumnal equinox. It is very interesting to observe that you see this top horizontal line, which means that the sun has not reached the upper combination yet. And actually, when we look at the ring poles, we see that the information is not the act, is not the basic phases, but it is somewhere between the basic phases. Uh, like here, for example, the sun is not yet uh, has not yet reached the upper combination. Now, the next one. Uh, the next one contains the same information, and this particular cylinder, um, cylinder impression from Kish shows the opposite and gives the opposite information, where the sun has not reached uh, has not reached the winter uh, the winter combination, but it is heading towards it. Actually, the in astronomical information can be read on several levels, but unfortunately, I have no time right now. Uh, I would like to show you some other illustrations. The third millennium plaque showing Inanna. You can already say that this is the winter. Uh, this, this is the winter solstice, and this is the frieze of ivory inlaid from the new palace of Ashur. And we can see the god with four streams. The upper streams are holding Doni in its lower combination. However, the lower streams are holding Doni in, in, in its summer combination. Differently put, all this information was there, and it was expressed in different ways by manipulating. Manipulating the image of the by manipulating the image of the uh, rod and ring or doni. I would like to particularly stress the wheel type of a Sumerian cart. Please have a look at uh, have a look at the center of the wheels. Now it is easy for you to identify what particular image is depicted by the center of the wheel. This is the combined image of the winter and summer solstices. Even more obvious uh, is the uh, the is this information becomes from the royal tombs of Ur, where we see exactly the same arrangement, look at the center as we saw in the beads and the chaplet. It's, it, it's very interesting that uh, the Kartvelian linguistic evidence also supports the origin of the wheel or these symbols from the Kartvelians of Tavuridoni. Now in Georgian we have the word, um, in Georgian we have the word, um, sorry, sorry. Anyway, uh, so in Georgian we have the word uh, uh, tfali, and tfali stands for two different meanings. It is the organ uh, of seeing, this is I, and on the other hand it is a wheel. In the Swan language we have the same, uh, the same word is expressed by the word bar bar, which is the name of the which is the name of the Sumerian of the Sumerian sample. So you see that the linguistic and the cultural information actually complement each other. And now I would like, to, very briefly, I would like to show you the. Uh, this is the inscription of the 10th century, called Sahaputi inscription, and uh, this is Doni taken out of the inscription in isolation, and this is Doni. Um, this is Doni with the outer tracing. Now uh, again, I have to and show you Doni with the uh, with the net. If this is this is just an alphabetic sign. However, if I hold the alphabetic sign of Doni with my right hand and support it with my uh, support the bottom with my left hand, you will immediately see that it is the flowing vase that we very frequently see in different depictions. And here, here I would like uh, to show a few. A few illustrations. This is the flowing bus from uh, uh, the, this piece is kept in wood, and you see that they are basically the same. And the outer uh, and the uh, outer depictions are, uh, are, uh, are just identical. Now it is interesting to know. It is interesting to notice that the flowing bus for several millennia was kept in one and the same shape. However, in certain uh, uh, in certain depictions they are elongated slightly, like here. And we find the same type in, in the Kartvelian manuscripts. Look at this. This is the Kartvelian of Taruli Doni. Uh, this is the uh, 
uh, flowing blood. So you see that they are, again, this is much more artistic, uh, artistic so to say, while well, the other one is more, is more schematic. I do not have more time to, uh, to make conclusions, but one of the most important conclusions that I would like to make is that Cartwellian linguistic evidence, Cartwellian cultural evidence is extremely important, as, as my research shows, to be included in Assyriological studies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this lecture and I should add for this performance. I never experienced a lecture, a performative lecture. So we have a little time for one or two short questions or comments. I'm at a disadvantage because I have not heard your earlier talks at Ben Rye, nor uh, do I, this is my first acquaintance with the Kartuli uh, language. So I can't get into any um, uh, chronological problems. But uh, I am worried that the methodology appears to be at first glance as being more mystical uh, than maybe uh, uh, scientific. Just on the spot, I can do the same thing. I, I suspect with the, um, the Roman alphabet, the letter uh, A um, is from Alto originally. And therefore, I could um, theoretically, so I doing this on the spot, uh, Alpu went through various different uh, uh, forms. So maybe Alpu represents Taurus uh, in the, um, uh, the astrological signs. And it went through various forms as well. Um, if you follow the, the diachrony of the Alp in, the, in West Semitic languages, it went through various forms and correlated those with various parts of the equinox. Um, you can do that, but it seems more mystical than it does. Uh, uh, there, there are too many uh, things that have, would have to be made, it appears to be, uh, let alone uh, it's like a chronological difficulty as well. All right, now, one of the things that the answer to this question is basically, um, the, uh, is basically concerned with the other aspect of Doni. As I have already mentioned, Doni can be viewed from two different aspects. On the one hand, it is an alphabetical sign. It is, uh, it is studied on the same systematic characteristic features as any, uh, as any writing element, any, any writing sign in any alphabet. And the other aspect, which is the hidden aspect, which gives it exactly this mystic nature, is the encoded information in it. So therefore, your question basically combines these two aspects. It is mystic, yes, to a certain extent, because it contains hidden information. Why is it kind of dubious? Because the information that we have from the monographic studies of many alphabets do not support this. Yes, I agree, but as I said, the uh, foundation here is that Domi itself has two different modifications, hidden and clear, I mean, obvious, something that is seen. Yes, please. So, uh, yes. On the one for remark, uh, a road in the ring is a sign well known in sonorology. There are Shubir Ashkir, two signs of, a king's, of the king's power as a shepherd. And I think there is no relation between the signs of power uh, of king as shepherd and equinoxes. Okay, now. Uh, to answer this question, again, we have to consider the visible and the hidden. Now, as I, uh, as I showed, for example, on the example of the necklaces and, uh, and the chaplet, for example, or even the sample chamash holding the ring, uh, the road that do we know what symbol it is? Do we have the name of the symbol? Do we know the meaning of the symbol? Do we know the functions of the symbol? Have these been left by the creators of the symbols? No. How do we know what they represent, what they mean? Of course, by the descriptive, uh, by, 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 the, by the images that we have. So by the description, what we can afford. And then we make our judgments. This is exactly the same. Yes, we can have it, but we never know what is hidden behind these symbols. Like, for example, the chaplet. Would I have ever imagined before I uh, came to analysis that any necklace, for example, or any chaplet could represent this? No, I didn't. But the information led me to that. And this is the hidden information. Once again, I stress this point. This is the hidden information, a kind of an undercurrent, which is basically feeding these symbols. That's why they do not die. That's why they repeat one of the, they are, you know, they are repeated in their shape 
throughout millennia? Can it be accidental that the name was not left? Can it be accidental that the, those people and the priests basically who knew the information did not, you know, kind of overlook the name of the, uh, of the symbol? Of course not. So in this case, we come to the conclusion that, you know, this must have been a kind of a, a purposeful concealment. Thank you. Thank you again. I have the impression it's all answered and a million questions are open and we are going for a coffee break now. Thank you all.